look, it means a huge amount to the Conservative Party and to Giles that you guys have come out today. Um, I think this is the first time ever that Connor Burns has addressed a hundred wets. Genuinely. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we hugely appreciate you coming out. I know many of you are regular road trippers, but there's some new faces as well, and it's a delight to see all of you. The, it means a lot to me personally that we are coming out to campaign against you, and I'll tell you why. I want all of you, all of you, to have in your head, not just today's campaign, uh, making sure that we win on Thursday, but the campaign that we're going to be fighting in Rochester over the next few weeks. Right? Now, now, here is why. We had, last Saturday, last Sunday, 750 people, many of you were here, who was, who was here out in Birmingham North? Yeah. 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 Half of you were out, okay? We had 750 people out in Birmingham Northfield. And I wrote to every member of Parliament and I said to them, I need your help to be a leader on the day. Please can you come and help us? And do you know who the first member of Parliament was who replied to me? The first member of Parliament? It was Mark Reckless. Who? Exactly. Who he? Who he? And Mark Reckless wrote, and he said, I will be delighted to come and lead a team to the Birmingham Northfield campaign day. And someone from my team rang him up the day before, um, on, on the Friday, two days before the, the campaign day, and said to him, left a message and said, please can you let us know the details, we're looking forward to seeing you, we want you to be a coach leader, leading a team of 50 people on the day, will you join us? And Amar Reckless left a voicemail, and his voicemail said the following, he said, I would be delighted to come and join you. I would be delighted to lead a team, because I want to have a conservative majority, I will be there. That was what he said in a voicemail, which we have recorded because we are not morons. <laughs> And the reason he signed up was because he knew that there was speculation about what he was doing. And he wanted, he wanted to hide behind your hard-working activism. He wanted to hide behind your loyalty and use your loyalty as a Trojan horse for his treachery. That's what he was doing. And I say to you this, let us go to Rochester and repay his treachery with some interest. Will you go with me? for me to introduce Conor Burns, Member of Parliament, to speak to you this evening. Now, Conor Burns has been a long-standing friend of many people in this room, but he has also been a long, was a long-standing friend of the late, great, lamented Margaret Thatcher. Now, Conor, Conor was friends with her for over 20 years. I know few people who have a better insight into her mind, her mentality, her understanding, her political philosophy than Conor Burns. And he was friends with her, mostly because Conor Burns is a great friend. He will be a great friend to all of you. But he was also friends with her because he shared so many of her political beliefs and her ideology. I hope that when he speaks, many of you will hear quite literally the voice of Margaret Thatcher coming through as he tells you anecdotes and stories from her time. But he was also, Conor was also a great friend of Douglas Carswell. And one of the things about politics is that friendship matters so much. And one of the sad things about what Douglas has done, it is has torn apart friendships on the right. And Connor is going to talk this evening a little bit about how one reconciles the challenge of divided friendships and yet at the same time shared political beliefs. And how one reconciles those things. It's going to be a very personal speech, a very intimate speech. And finally, the reason why it's a great privilege for me to introduce Connor is because Connor has been a great friend and supporter of mine for over 15 years. Over time, I hope he will be a great supporter and friend of yours because he has always been so to good Conservatives. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Connor Burns, Member of Parliament. gentlemen, can I start off by saying to each and every one of you in this room tonight, the two most underused words in the modern Conservative Party, thank you. Yeah. 
thank you for everything you do for our party and in particular for what you did for our party in Clacton today. The party doesn't belong to any leadership. The leadership are the custodians of the party. The party belongs to you, our members. And on behalf of my colleagues in Parliament, the party chairman and the Prime Minister, I say to you, thank you for all you do. It will be a pleasure to tell you a few stories tonight about, about Lady T, who we, we still miss so terribly. Um, in those final years of her life, when she came back from so many health scares, it was sort of impo impossible to imagine a time where she wouldn't be with us. As I quoted the words of the poem in the House of Commons, if I had thought thou couldst have died, I might not weep for thee, but I forgot when by thy side that thou couldst mortal be. Margaret Thatcher inspired a generation of Conservatives to come in to politics, and many of them were elected to Parliament at that last general election. Those members of Parliament and what they will achieve in future years are in many ways the greatest testament and legacy that Margaret Thatcher may yet have to her name. Margaret, as Mark mentioned, um, was a great friend of mine, and in the later years of her life, she came down to campaign for me in the 2001 general election in Eastleigh, and we took her to a health club. And she declared to the chief executive of the entire group, these places are a complete waste of time. <laughs> Up and down stairs keeps me fit. <laughs> we went into the main body of the gym area, and she spotted a very, very large lady on a rowing machine, bright wet red and sweating profusely. Uh, Margaret went up to her and said, now tell me, dear, how much would you lose doing this? About three pounds? And we said, oh no, nothing like that, a couple of hundred calories. And Margaret, with no trace of irony, said, well, you better keep going, dear, hadn't you? <laughs> Even in those final years, although somewhat impaired with memory loss, she was still capable of delivering the odd surprise remark. I remember on the weekend that Colonel Gaddafi was rightly executed in, in Libya. We were watching the Sunday evening news and a picture of Tony Blair and Colonel Gaddafi came onto the screen with Blair hugging Gaddafi. And I said to him, look at that, Margaret. There's Blair as Prime Minister hugging Colonel Gaddafi. And she looked at the screen and looked back and said, well, President Reagan and I didn't hug him. We bombed him. <laughs> The book she had by her chair in those final years was a, a, an excellent book by John O'Sullivan, which I thoroughly recommend to all of you, the title of which was The President, the Pope, and the Prime Minister, The Three Who Changed the World. Uh, Margaret once picked it up. It says here, The President, the Pope, and the Prime Minister, The Three Who Changed the World. I said, well, you must be very proud of that. I think they've got the order wrong. <laughs> Many of the Ancient enmities throughout her career were healed in the final years. She was, in those final years, much becalmed. I have to tell you one uh, enmity that was not and was never forgiven. On the occasion that I resigned from the government to vote against Nick Clegg's abortionate plans to destroy the House of Lords, I was, I was explaining to her that following Sunday that we actually did need some reform of the Lords. And one reform of the laws that I was in favour of was actually getting some of our Conservative peers to turn up and speak and vote. And she said, well, who do I have in mind? And I said, knowing this would be provocative, I said, well, Michael Heseltine's been there for over 10 years, and he still hasn't made his maiden speech. To which she responded quick as a flash, well, look on the bright side, at least we haven't had to listen to it. <laughs> On one of the last occasions that I saw her at her home in Chester Square, I'd taken a taxi from the House of Commons to Chester Square. I often usually walked, but on this occasion it was a particularly miserable November evening. And I hailed a taxi and said, Chester Square, please. And the taxi driver said, which end of the square do you want, Gov? I said, the house with the police are outside. He said, Maggie Thatcher's Gov. I said, that's right. What are you going there for, then? I said, well, I'm a friend of hers, I don't have a drink. What do you do then? I said, I'm a Tory MP. And when we turned up, I went to pay the fare, uh, and he refused to take it, and he said, your fare tonight, Gov, is you go in there and you tell her from me, we ain't had a good and since. <laughs> and so I did go in, and I did tell her that, uh, and she responded, well, he's quite right too. <laughs> I told that story 
I told that story in the House of Commons. I have to say, he laughed, but in a funny way. Which is one of the many reasons that I wasn't hanging around my telephone in the recent reshuffle. I just want to mention someone else in connection with her, because there was somebody else who was integral to everything she did, and that was her late great husband, Dennis. And Dennis was a true Great Britain. Dennis had more names for alcoholic drinks than anyone else I think I've ever known. An opener, a lifter, a brightener, a sharpener, a snifter, a snort, a snorterino, and a large gin and tonic without the tonic. I just wanted, I just wanted to tell you one story that Dennis used to tell about himself when he was travelling on business in the mid-1980s uh, when Mrs. T was in number 10, and he was taking a train back to London, and he said he got to the station, and all the carriages were full, bar one, and it had a sign in the window saying, reserved, Northampton Psychiatric Unit. So Dennis said, well, naturally I got on. <laughs> train pulled into Northampton a little while later, young male psychiatric nurse, highly strung, gaggle of patients, clipboard on, train pulls out, he starts to count them. One, two, three, four, five. He came to me, looks down, who are you? So I looked up at him, and I said, I, sir, am the husband of the Prime Minister. Six, <laughs> seven, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have been, in the two years since Margaret died, reflecting about what it was that made her such an incredible politician. What was it about her that gave her such a connection to the British public? And I've come to the conclusion that it's because she was authentic and she approached politics as being about individual people. She got more votes at her third general election than she did at her first. Mr Blair, who some in our party still look to, got five, got five million fewer votes at his third general election than at his first. I know who I would like to take my inspiration from. She took a view that the British public was made up of individuals. She always carried in her handbag, for as long as she had a handbag, her favorite verse of poetry from Rudyard Kipling. So when the world is asleep and there seems no hope of waking, out of some long bad dream that makes her mutter and moan, Suddenly, all men arise to the noise of fetters breaking, and everyone smiles at his neighbour and tells him his soul is his own. It was no coincidence, no accident, that the, the, the uh, hymn used at her funeral, chosen by her, ended, and soul by soul and silently her shining bounds increase. Not group by group or minority by minority, but soul by soul and silently her shining bounds increase. Margaret understood that the nation is made up of millions of men and women determined to improve their lot. She spoke of, that, reminding us that Adam Smith spoke of the wealth of nations as well as the wealth of individuals, that the wealth of nations is built on the boundless energies and talents of millions of free people engaged in free enterprise. She pointed out that if people could see a link between risk and return, between effort and reward, they would take the risk and make the effort. And I lost count of the number of occasions when at receptions people would come up to her and tell her, I started my business when you introduced the Enterprise Allowance Scheme, and I now employ dozens of people, and I want to say thank you. And she always said to them, it should be me thanking you, for without people like you, Thatcherism would just be a political theory. She understood that the British economy is the British people at work, their efforts and their attitudes. And she spoke in her final conference speech about those core values that have always driven our property. She referred to them as basic truths and principles which make Britain great. Personal liberty, private property, and the rule of law on which democratic freedoms everywhere are founded. She said of conservatism and how true it is still today, ours is a creed which travels and endures. Its truths are written on the human heart. Margaret Thatcher 
was a conservative to her fingertips and wished nothing more than that our party prospered in general elections and gave wise and good governance to the United Kingdom. And to anyone who speculates that Margaret Thatcher might have had sympathy for another political party, I tell you categorically, she did not. Yeah. She would want yeah. conservative yeah. candidates. Now, we face two by-elections. One down the road in Clapton and another one. Let me address the second one first. If you set out to inflict maximum damage and disruption on people to whom you have stood shoulder to shoulder until the day before, then do not be surprised if you had the effect of uniting the Conservative Party and taking the fight to you in that constituency and making sure a Conservative is elected. Douglas Carswell for some 22 years. We both were involved in Conservative Students together in the early 90s when Dan Hannan and I resigned from the National Executive Conservative Future when I was elected its chairman, but my opponent who lost was appointed instead. And the reason for that, I share that with you to tell you that I have form on this. I was leading the student opposition to the Maastricht Treaty at the time. Douglas was engaged in that campaign too. And you know what? On Europe, Douglas, Dan and I, we were proved right. We were proved right on Maastricht. We were proved right on the single currency. We were proved right on Europe. And the party now has as mainstream policy the views we were espousing back then over 20 years ago. And the reason I would say that people should be voting Conservative is straightforward. Because I agree with Douglas. I even agree with Mark until a week ago. The only way you get the in-out referendum is to have a majority conservative government led by David Cameron after the next general election. There is no other way, no other way to do that. And a vote for the United Kingdom Independence Party. And many of my friends have gone there and I respect them. And I believe that at some point we need to reunite the right. But at the moment, UKIP and Labour stand in the way of the British public having that say on Europe that I have argued for over 20 years. <laughs> and to those who say, and there are some, that they don't believe the Prime Minister will get the deal that they want when he goes to renegotiate our arrangements in Brussels, let's be clear on that. If you don't like the Prime Minister's result, you can vote no in that referendum. It is as straightforward as that. It is self-defeating and ridiculous to elect people who will stop you having your say. Absolutely. And let me just say this. We have probably the worst opposition that I have seen in my political lifetime. We have a shadow business secretary who extols the virtues of the Labour shadow executive in Scotland and then can't name any of them. It is Forgivable that we have a shadow pension secretary who sounds like a cartoon character. It is absolutely unforgivable that she doesn't know the value of the basic state pension. And a shadow prime minister, I ask you, who can't remember the deficit which he played such a large part in one of This bunch of loons aren't fit to run Britain. Let me tell you about that speculation that Mr. Farage occasionally engages in. That somehow... Margaret Thatcher would support UKIP. Categorically, she would not. And I want tonight to end that facile speculation by telling you that we don't need to debate it, <coughs> speculate about it, conjure about it. Let me tell you what she said to me in the November before she died, when we talked about UKIP and our prospects of the general election. She said this, only the Conservative Party is a big enough entity to achieve the change we need for Britain. Be under no illusions, Margaret Thatcher would have wanted David Cameron to win the next general election. Mm -hmm. I am by this.
in her final <coughs> public speech, about six or nine months after she had officially given up making public speeches, she came to the Botley Grange Hotel in Eastleigh in 2002. And as we were going around, someone asked her at the reception, Lady Thatcher, what is your greatest domestic achievement? And she replied in words that may surprise some of you. She said, Tony Blair and New Labour, we forced our opponents to change. And that is absolutely true. The Labour Party only became electable under Blair when they promised that they didn't believe anything that they previously said, when they said they'd never read their own speeches or believed their own convictions. They were only elected because they embraced the politics that Margaret Thatcher and John Major be after her had forged. And I take you back to not the last Labour conference, which I'm sure they want to forget, even as much as we want to remind people about, uh, but to the one before. When Ed Miliband stood on the soapbox in the town centre in Brighton, and he was asked the question, are you going to bring back socialism? And he replied in words that should send a chill up the spine of Middle Britain. He said, that is what I am doing, sir. And if you listen to their announcements on rent, on the seizure of privately owned land from private companies, this is not the Labour Party of New Labour. This is the Labour Party of socialism. Let me end as I began by saying to each and every one of you, Thank you. And as Sir Humphrey explained to Bernard in one of my favourite lines from Yes Minister, <laughs> gratitude is merely a lively expectation of favours to come. So thank you for all you will do between now and that election. <laughs> so I get a profound sense, a profound and real sense, that something fundamental has changed in British politics in the last couple of weeks. Now is the time for this party to take our fight to Labour. Now is the time to burnish our philosophy, set out our vision and explain our agenda to Britain. My friends, let them say of us, as we can say with pride and gratitude of Margaret Thatcher, that in our day, we too kept faith with freedom. Thank you very much. Some of the more uh, mundane logistics. So there is some more food, I think, coming out. We've got a little food.